Councillor Backer. Present. Councillor Dill. Here. Councillor Lennon. Here. Councillor Lynch. Here. Councillor Rowe. Here. Councillor Swift Kayada. Here. Manager McGovern. Yep. Okay, thank you. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, now we'll move on to review of the minutes of meetings number five and six. Do we have a motion to accept the meetings, uh, the minutes? <laughs> Anne? I, I have a motion, but I have a couple of corrections. Okay, please. Um, on the April 9th one, these are just typos, I believe. On the second page, under item number 63, um, in the middle of the paragraph, it says, Councillor Backer wanted to make the point of saying that he was not opposed to the ordinance, but did not see why it should have different, I think it means effects, EFF, effects on single family homes as opposed with a D to commercial buildings. That was that one. And then, do you want to do these one at a time? Um, I think we can do them together. And then on the April 25th, um, minutes on page three <coughs> under item 76 there's the chart that showed all the different bond things and there's a subtotal that says 810,000 and I think that should be 660,000 the grand total seemed to be okay oh I see okay with that so I'd move with those amendments. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Any other changes? Um, on on um, the uh, minutes from our April 25 meeting under item 76 that uh, Councillor Swift Kayata was just referring to, I actually thought that maybe she was headed to this. Um, under item 76, there is a motion that says, motion was amended to include a request from the town council outlining what exactly is bondable and an amount that can be bonded. Um, I read this in the minutes and I wasn't quite sure what this meant and whether this was even a correct and, reference to a motion. If I could add, since I'm listed as the person who made that motion, I don't remember making that motion. I remember suggesting that it would be wise of us um, to, to check with the manager who was not able to be present that night just to make sure that he checked with bond council or whoever, just to make sure we were doing this in the right form. Yeah, but I think I, I recall. I don't remember us having a motion and a vote on it. So. So I, I didn't remember any such motion having been made, and I suggest that, that um, reference be deleted from the minutes. I concur. Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember you bringing that up, Ann, when, when you had suggested that. Everybody good? Any other suggestions? And I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last item that Councillor Swift Kayata had mentioned with regard to the grand total. Oh, um, on item number 76, my comment was the subtotal number instead of 810,000 should be 660,000, but that every, all the other numbers looked right, including the grand total on the next page for. Two million three hundred ninety-two thousand six hundred fifty dollars. Because the A ten included the one fifty. Um, and, and again, I, th I think I was distracted by whatever hammering is going on right behind me or above my head. I think it's the heating um, system. The heating. But <laughs> below the grand total, and again, I didn't want to say this because I didn't know whether Anne had already mentioned it. But below the grand total in the next paragraph, it refers to, to expenditures of forty-two million dollars. That four should be deleted. The last line right above item 77 on page 4. Yes, you're correct. There's a number of 42,392,000. I don't have that. I have yeah. 2 million. No, oh. it's below that. Or am I missing? Okay. It's, oh, it's I see. in the line right above yeah, the, the 4 got added. The 4 in there. should not be there. You're absolutely correct. A lot of money. 
Yes, it is. <laughs> thank you, David. I, yes. I missed both of those, so thank you, David. A big meeting. Yes, you did. Okay, any other changes? Okay, all in favor of the accepting the minutes as amended? Okay. Good. Okay, now we will move on to reports and commissions. I, excuse me, reports and correspondence. I'm mixing up my words tonight. Sorry about that. Reports and correspondence. Does anybody have any that they'd like to share? No? Okay. I, I would like to acknowledge uh, the fact that we have received uh, several emails from various concerned citizens regarding the budget. A couple were a couple emails were uh, in favor of a 2.8 percent budget. Several emails were in favor of a 3.2 percent budget for the schools. And um, generally, there was support for from other uh, citizens for the three percent compromise. So, I also want to acknowledge a piece of correspondence that um, we received from the Re Cape Elizabeth Recycling Committee, and this is um, with regard to recycling in general, and more specifically, they are sharing with us some information about Brunswick. Apparently, the town of Brunswick did not have a very effective uh, recycling campaign, and they went to a paper bag system and dramatically increased their recycling efforts and reduced their trash, um, thereby increasing their landfill usage by 14 years, or tripling its um, Life, lifetime. Now, why, why is that relevant? It's relevant because um, Eco Maine, which we belong to, just went to a single stream recycling effort. And I was lucky enough to go there last week to um, tour the facility. And now they can um, take all recycled materials in one single stream, and it has a sorting capacity. So it should really dramatically increase our ability to recycle, which in turn should reduce our um, trash, which in turn will be beneficial for the community financially. When we recycle, the, um, what happens is that material gets sold. The money from the recycling effort goes to reducing the cost of Ecomain that we, that we participate in. And the, thing, the items that we do not recycle, we have to pay for. It's $159 per ton, a tipping fee. So the more we recycle, the more we save. So just wanted to share that with you. Anything else? Nope. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the town manager's report. You want to do the presentation? Uh, I was going to do it right after okay. the report. Yeah, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm going to give a little longer report than I usually do because there's been a lot going on, and I also did commit it, most of it to writing. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's important to, to go over some of it. Uh, as everyone is aware, we had quite a storm this, uh, during the school vacation week at the beginning of Patriots Day with about eight inches of rain and wind gusts uh, in excess of 80. We, we've had reports from some folks of over 90 miles an hour uh, down on Shore Road, so it was, it was definitely windy. Uh, it's different. At one point, about two thirds of the town was without power, uh, and there's for some, for mo a lot of them, for over two nights. I think one re really interesting point is last month I talked about the storm the week before the last council meeting and all the calls to public safety. Those calls didn't compare to the calls on this storm. Uh, this storm, there were about 2,050 calls were handled in a three day period. And I was at the county dispatch center for a meeting last week, the, the new dispatch center that just opened that serves a number of towns. They had, during the peak of the storm, about eight dispatchers on duty, and they handled 500 calls for the entire day, and they were very busy with eight dispatchers. We handled as many as 800 calls in a single day, maybe it was more than that, I don't have the day-by-day -day breakdown, with one to two dispatchers on duty. So, you know, they, they had dispatch is almost to a ratio of eight to one to what we did for handling, uh, you know, 30 to 40 percent fewer calls than we did. So, you know, really amazing when you, when you look at what the dispatchers did during that period. It was a good thing that there was no school that week, so we weren't getting the calls about, you know, is there school and some of those, because uh, who knows how many calls there would have been that period. 
in the one 24-hour period when the storm really hit, we had 200 fire calls. This is for arcing wires, for water issues, et cetera. This compares with 361 calls in all of fiscal year 2007. We had, you know, more than, we had 200 in one day compared to 361 in a whole year. Pretty significant. Uh, public works time has been consumed primarily with brush pickup since then. Uh, we had minor damage to several municipal buildings and to a number of fences. Uh, we've, we had to hire a contractor to rebuild Shore Road at Pond Cove. Uh, after the first high tide, because the, the shoulders were washing out, we didn't want to lose the whole road. Uh, there was a significant damage to the town-owned Cliff House Beach off Seaview Avenue. There's a stairway going down there. Everything under that stairway is totally washed out. It's just hanging there, a concrete stairway. And the, the beach has just filled, has been filled with debris. Uh, we faced about 20 locations on roads where traffic was totally blocked, where we needed to bring a public works truck in uh, where possible to, to cut up the, the material and to sort of bulldoze it with loaders and other equipment out of the way. We couldn't do that in some areas because there were live wires. And as I think we all know, it, it took uh, Senator Payne Power a couple days to get here. But you know, when, it, when it goes back to the issue of connectivity, which you know some people aware of, I think it's important to remember that we had 20 locations on roads with trees totally blocking traffic, including at one point three different locations on Shore Road. So there were people in, for example, in the Pond Cove area of Shore Road could, get, could not get out in, in either direction because of the way the branches were down. And, you know, we didn't try to go up through uh, Cranbrook that way, but my guess is uh, that would have been also washed out or blocked out. Uh, just to give you an idea of the public safety, we had heavy limbs. We had a heavy limb hit one of our public works truck while it was being driven, one of the pickup trucks, and you can see the dents right over where the driver was sitting. You know, a tree actually came down in the truck. We were lucky, weren't more seriously hurt. We still had phone complaints, though, about Fort Williams being closed to sightseers uh, during the worst of the storm. And about half hour after one of those calls, we had a rescue call for someone who hurt their leg while falling, falling off the rocks at Fort Williams. We had hundreds of people going to Fort Williams during the 80 mile per hour winds trying to get on the rocks and to get as close as they could to see the water. And it's, it is a real challenge when, when, you know, we have 200 fire calls that we're also dealing with and we have, you know, all, all the rest of the activity going on. Uh, the police department lost their computer network. There was heavy wind and Rain came up through the louver and back down, an issue we've since uh, tried to work our way around. The Portland Water District just did an amazing job keeping the, the sewer pump stations going. Uh, there's about 20 different pump stations around town. As luck would have it, almost all of them were in the areas without power. And so, from what I understand, some of those folks work 72 straight hours just keeping those pump stations, uh, those generators on and so that the there were still a few sewer backups, but not as many as there might have been. Uh, the brush pickup program has so far picked up over 5,000 yards of brush. And if you figure most of those trucks are six yard trucks, and even the, uh, we, we've used uh, three outside contractors, uh, but even then you're only getting about uh, you know, 10 to 12 yards per truck. So just a tremendous amount of material uh, being, being uh, moved. The library served as a refuge for many citizens who do not have heat in their homes. And, I really appreciate their help as well. Uh, we're continuing to find out FEMA assistance. It appears that up about 75% of what the town spends may be reimbursable. They're having a meeting tomorrow that Bob Malley's going to to explain uh, more of that. But regardless, it will still cost the uh, taxpayers a considerable amount here through the needs of uh, the municipal needs in the cleanup costs, but as well as you know, a lot of folks had damage in their own homes and. I think everyone's still trying to figure out exactly what that assistance might be, and more information will keep coming from the federal government. Uh, we're going to have follow-up meetings with Central Maine Power to discuss communication with the Water District, uh, with Cumberland County Emergency Management, and also internally uh, to see, uh, you know, what we learned from this experience. Uh, you know, aside from that, you know, uh, you know, you know what Public Works are doing. I think it's important to also highlight that they've opened the cemetery for the season. They're doing the spring burials. They've gotten all the different ball fields ready for, for uh, the, the spring sports seasons. We're very pleased that Cape Elizabeth Little League 
uh, asked Bob Malley, our Director of Public Works, and the Parks uh, Foreman, Forrest King, to throw out the first ball to start the Little League season. Uh, that was an appreciation of all the work that everyone in Public Works does uh, to help the Little League program, not only this year, but throughout the years. Uh, there's a tremendous partnership uh, between the town and Little League, mostly through Public Works, and uh, it was really nice that the Little League recognize that by asking for us and Bob to throw out the first ball. We also, Pat Anderson, in the last two weeks received an award from Eco Maine uh, for our efforts at recycling. She's the new, uh, relatively new, not so new anymore, transfer station attendant, but just doing a great job. And that was a recommendation from the recycling committee uh, that she received that award. Uh, we received bids for paving of Shore Road from the town center to the old main gate at Fort Williams. If you hear complaints about uh, that, the, the it's a little dicey, I guess, and uh, we only have the cost per ton. It's $56, where, which has gone up quite a bit from previous years, but we're going to try to find a way to work out a, a plan to pay for that uh, prior to the end of the fiscal year. We also, that paving bid also included paving Spurwink Avenue from the, the uh, power substation back to the Kuda Club with the state doing the portion uh, eventually from the power substation back towards the Spurwink Church. Uh, final design is now ongoing in the proposed traffic light at the high school entrance. We also awarded bids for sewer and drainage work on Wood Road at Geldart Lane. Construction began on the turf field, making great progress there. And we also, this was also the month that we received the permit for the overboard discharge at Portland Headlight, which was a 15-year permit, the one that expired, but very significant to get that because if we hadn't received that permit, we would have been looking at tremendous challenges dealing with uh, sewerage issues at Portland Headlight. Uh, I haven't seen much publicity on this, but the planning board met with the South Portland Planning Board uh, for a joint meeting to discuss mutual interests. That in part grew out of some of the concerns on Edgewood Road. Uh, we had members of the fire department who went to the Cumberland County Fire Attack School. More than a, a dozen members spent a weekend doing that. School department also helped out with all the busing for that event, not only for our fire department, but all the fire departments. And it, it, it's also, uh, it, actually this should read, there's 200 horses that reside in Cape Elizabeth. And part of the training that was, took place that weekend was how to rescue all of these large animals. So, you know, it's something that you know, you don't think of, but it's, it's something that I know that the stable owners here in Cape Elizabeth uh, are concerned with. Uh, we received delivery of a new fire department vehicle that was 95% paid for by a federal grant of over 100000 uh, The fire department appreciation evening is this coming Saturday at Puputik. Uh, the Hazardous Materials Collection Day is being planned for on May 12th. Jim Cox is coordinating the Memorial Day Parade, which is on May 28th. The council has invitations. Uh, here this evening. Uh, would the pool be closed from May 25th to June 18th uh, for the usual maintenance? And if some, those of you that go to the pool in the deep, on the shallow end, there's been some tile challenges. Uh, it's, we're being closed an additional week to deal with those. Uh, fitness center is going to be closed for three days for annual maintenance. Uh, April's working on setting up the polling on June 12th. We'll be voting on uh, highway bonds for the, for the Main Department of Transportation. Uh, the two workshops with the Comprehensive Planning Commission have been confirmed for May 21 and 29. There'll be a Trails Day on June 2nd. Uh, the Family Fun Day Committee is meeting downstairs right now, planning for Family Fun Day. There will be fireworks. The contract for that was signed. Uh, the TD Bank North Beach to Beacon 10K Committee is planning, and some of our department heads are participating in that. And you know, finally, I. We were all really saddened here at the town hall by the, the traffic fatality that happened on Shore Road. The young 17-year-old woman who died, Rachel McCarthy, her mother is the office manager in our Sessing Codes planning office. And, uh, you know, it's a very difficult time for Laura. She did come back to work today. Uh, but, you know, I know you, you all share and, uh, you know, the sympathy and condolences for her and her family. But uh, it, it was an extremely busy month, and, you know, I really want to express appreciation to all of the different departments who participated, it was really took a collective effort of them, and I think it was important to spend a little time talking about it because of the, just the extent of uh, what has occurred over the last month. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for a very thorough and uh, informative report. We're going to move on to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda, and we're going to begin with uh, a presentation from 
Colonel Chris Hayden, the uh, Wing Commander of Civil Air Patrol in the state of Maine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Governor, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chris, I'm going to ask you if you could use oh, this. Can I use the Ladies and gentlemen, as uh, the chairman just announced, I'm the uh, wing commander for the main wing, U.S. Air Force Auxiliary, is at Air Patrol. Uh, last summer, we sent uh, 30 cadets and officers to Dunfermline, Scotland, as an exchange with the Air Training Corps, which is the equivalent of our air cadet program in, in this country, which we run. Um, and we, uh, they spent two weeks in, in London, and we did it by raising money. And we raised the money through a lithograph. Uh, in fact, we had a painting made, which we're going to present today. Uh, we've had 1,000 copies printed, and we sold them throughout the state of Maine. We were able to raise the $30,000 it cost to send our cadets to Scotland. And um, I have with me uh, Tech Sergeant uh, Wilson, who's also a caper. I'm a caper, by the way. Uh, and and uh, Sergeant, if you could just quickly unveil it, and I'll tell you a little bit about the history of behind the actual painting itself. So go ahead, please, uh, Sergeant. Well, our oh, no, no, just, just unveil it. I'll, that's all right. I'll, I'll explain it. I, w I wouldn't have surprised you like that. Um, it actually is fortuitous, and the, really the reason why I want the town of Cape Elizabeth to have it is because you'll notice there are two airplanes flying over Portland Headlight. The aircraft in front is actually one of our last generation. We have a new generation of airplane now. Uh, and right behind it is one of our 1942 airplanes. And you'll see it's actually, if you go closely, it's carrying a depth charge. What's fortuitous about the picture and the artist, who is Steve Attack, a famous aviation writer, uh, sort of painter, did not realize um, that the juxtaposition between the airplanes and, and Portland Headlight is that that's where our headquarters was during 1942 through about the end of 1950, through the 50s. The other amazing uh, point is that one of the three founders of the Civil Air Patrol was Guy P. Gannett from Cape Elizabeth. And of course, you probably also know him as the owner of the Portland Press Herald and WGME Television. And he was one of the people who had the foresight in 1941 as the war clouds were rising over, uh, over Europe. He saw what was happening. We had ships sinking and burning off of uh, Crescent Beach. And we had very little war material in, in this country. And he put all the private pilots together and formed the Civil Air Patrol, which came under civil defense. And they basically held the fort until our war material machine was up and running and we finally had a real fighting force. In fact, we have more airplanes today in the Civil Air Patrol than the whole United States had in 1941. So that gives you an idea of how small and how dangerous and what a precarious moment that really was. And so Guy Gannett of Cape Elizabeth is one of the people who made this happen and probably saved us quite a lot. So, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present this to the town of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Colonel Hayden. We, we really appreciate that. That was wonderful. And I'm sure we'll find a nice place to hang the, the um, lithograph. Now we have an, an, another group that asked to speak this evening, and it's the uh, Kids Turf Committee, regarding um, some clarification on the line issue that has uh, come up. They asked to uh, do this so that all the public could uh, hear their comments. Is this all right right here? Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Ott, and I represent the Kids Turf Group, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the council. Uh, from the beginning, our mission has been a very simple one, and that is to do something positive for the kids and the adults in our community. And I'm here to talk, as Paul mentioned, about the lines. Um, I will be brief because I know there are far more pressing matters uh, to talk uh, about this evening. I've heard um, from various people that uh, the lines on the field, um, some people are trying to make it a gender issue. This is not a gender issue. And allow me to explain why. We chose permanent lines for four sports. 
girls soccer, boys soccer, football, and boys lacrosse. Um, Don Clark mentioned to me um, today that we now have um, some girls playing football. And uh, one young lady, who lives in my neighborhood, is entering her fourth season, as a matter of fact. Public Works, in addition to the four permanent lines, Public Works will paint lines for field hockey and for girls lacrosse. In a note um, that Keith Weatherby sent me um, a little while ago, I thought it really summed up the situation very well. And this is Keith speaking. I get the feeling that some people in the town may think that girls were slighted on the permanent lines on the field. They should realize that we treat all students the same. There are no boys and girls in my eyes. They are all athletes and students, and we treat all the athletes the same. The reality is, boys and girls sports will share the field equally. These aren't my words. These are the words of the people scheduling the use of the field. I'm talking home games, night games. Our decision to put those permanent lines down was based on research, facts, economics, and common sense. Our plan received the approval as we walk through this process from the town manager, public works, community services, the athletic director, the engineer on the project, and the turf vendor. You know, in addition, we've heard a lot of talk about communication over the last couple weeks, or lack of communication. We communicated our intentions regarding the lines on February 15th of this year. Again, February 15th. The carpet actually went into production on March 13th. We communicated this to the same group we've been communicating to throughout the entire project. If people feel they were not communicated with, the issue is not with us. It rests within your own chain of command. Now, let me give you a little background on why we made the decision that we made. When we first started this process and we met with the vendors, Graham Smith and I interviewed them. One of the first things we said to them, all of them, was we'd like five sets of lines on this field. To a vendor, they all said, don't do it. They advised two to three sets of lines. One is to avoid clutter. The other is to avoid tearing. You think about the stitching on your clothing. The more stitching you have, the higher the likelihood is that it can potentially tear someday after use. We also researched the possibility of lines changing for a variety of different sports. A member of our, our group talked to the National High School Sports Federation. We talked to U.S. Lacrosse. The reality is that girls' lacrosse lines are a fluid situation. They've changed, and we have um, reason to believe that there's a chance they could change again. You know, our engineer told us that field hockey changed twice. The lines for field hockey changed twice in the last six years. To remove old lines and install new ones could cost as much as thirty-five to forty thousand dollars per set. Per, per set, it's very labor-intensive. Why would we put the town at financial risk? Field wear and tear was also an issue. Again, we did research. We talked to Public Works extensively, and we identified the sports that do the most damage to grass fields and the lines on those grass fields. Those are in order. Boys lacrosse, football, soccer. I would also encourage people to look at a variety of different turf fields that have been installed in the area. NYA, Yarmouth, Scarborough, Fitzpatrick Stadium in Portland. All of those fields have painted lines and permanent lines. Economics was another reason. We, wanted, we sought to design the most cost-effective field for public works. That means time and materials. Boys lacrosse lines and football lines would have to be repeatedly painted time and time again throughout the process on that turf field if they were not permanent. 
This way, we're painting one sport per season. Again, minimizing the impact of maintenance and, and time and manpower. Integration is another reason. Uh, the proposed design integrates the lines of the sports that we're putting down, the permanent lines. They're sharing colors that, because they're integrated, it minimizes the total number of lines on the field. To come up with this innovative design, we talked to 11 different companies over the, I'm sorry, 11 different communities uh, over the phone. And we also looked at 150 different field designs. And the people we talked to, we asked them a simple question. We said, if you had to do it all over again with your permanent lines, what would you do differently? We, weren't, we learned quite a bit. We have always taken the long-term view on this project. You know, the, we had a goal of installing it in the fall. We didn't make it because we didn't raise enough money because we wanted to put in a first-rate field. We could have gone with a low-cost vendor, an unproven vendor, at a much, great, a much lesser cost, but I don't think we would have gotten a field that we'd all be proud of and one that I think will last a long time and be a real asset for the community. We could have gone with an all-green field and painted all the lines, which again would have put in a tremendous burden of time and expense uh, toward public works. You know, in a few weeks, um, we'll have a high-quality field that everybody can enjoy, kids and adults alike. Um, I'd also like to just take a quick moment to acknowledge someone that has been a tremendous help to us. Um, someone who I think, um, when I think of this person, I think of professionalism and I think of service to our community and I think we're really fortunate to have him as our town manager and that's Mike McGovern. Thank you, Michael. I don't think we could have done this without you. Really appreciate your help. And finally, when I look at the town council, when I look at the school board, um, I see a lot of well people with great intentions. People that, people that are intelligent, people that want to do things for the community. Like, like a well-intentioned town council or a well-intentioned school board, we also have a well-intentioned Kids Turf Committee, and I'm just hoping that we can all work together going forward um, to complete this project ses successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay, are, are there any other uh, parties in the audience that would like to um, Make any comments on items that are not on the agenda this evening? Okay. With that, we will move on. And I'm going to ask Marianne Lynch, who is the finance chair this year, to um, introduce us to the budget we'll be talking about this evening. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, Marianne, maybe I don't know how many people want to stay and how many want to leave, but if okay. people want to leave, they probably should feel free to and should just give them a minute to do that. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to take a few minutes um, to review really for the um, public that's here and the public that may be watching at home where um, the Finance Committee has been and where we, the Council, currently are in the budget process before we go to public hearing. That way we'll all be operating with the same set of baseline facts. The budget process has been going on for months now. The school department begins in the fall at the school and the district level. And then the school board labors over the budget most of the late winter. For the combined municipal and school budgets, the work began in earnest in January when the finance committee met and set a budget target for the town manager and the school of an increase of 2.5% an increase which was equal to the increase in the consumer price index for the previous 12 months. This number was slightly above the 2.47% LD1 expenditure increase limitation imposed by state law, a limitation which by state law we can override with a formal majority vote of the council. In February, the municipal department heads delivered their budgets to the town manager and the school board was by then diligently at work on their budget. On March 16th, the town manager delivered his budget to the Finance Committee with a 2.4% proposed increase in spending, thus staying within the LD1 limitations, 
and an additional request of $2 million in borrowing for such capital items as town center road improvements, sidewalks, a traffic light at the high school, preservation of the Spurwink Meeting House, school field improvements, green belt improvements, etc. The town manager also included an additional $168,000 for school security items and for a large window replacement at the middle school. Over the course of two long evenings, the Finance Committee met with each department head and most of the town boards and commissions for a review of the municipal budget. That review was completed on April 12th and resulted in a Finance Committee unanimous recommendation of a municipal budget of $8.5 million, an increase of slightly over $205,000, or 2.47 percent. The Finance Committee also recommended a bond issue of $1.9 million for municipal capital items. And I just say I'm rounding these numbers to the nearest 100,000, um, but there are a few more digits after them. Um, on the same day, that is April 12th, the school board delivered its $18.9 million budget proposal to the Finance Committee. Its, its budget request um, was for an expenditure increase of 693000 or 3.8% increase. The Finance Committee met with the school board on April 23rd and April 25th. On the first night, the Finance Committee asked the school board to re-examine its budget to see if there were additional long-term capital improvement items within the operating budget that could be properly moved from the operating budget to the bond issue. In response to that request, the school board submitted a new revised budget two nights later, reducing its requested 3.8% increase to 3.24 as a result of moving 102,000 to the bond issue. The school board also requested an additional 190,000 in other capital spending, which along with the earlier 168,000 for school security in the middle school window, brought the total school bond to 461,000. After looking at new updated information on the consumer price index, as well as considering the impact of the bond issue, the Finance Committee voted unanimously to recommend the bonding of 461000 for school items. And by a 4 to 3 vote, a school budget increase of 3 percent for a school budget of $18.79 million, or an increase in spending of $547,000. The bottom line is that the Finance Committee's recommended school budget is $43,000 less than that requested by the school board, two-tenths of one percent difference. On behalf of the Finance Committee, I want to thank the school board and the school department for going back and for taking another look at the budget and enabling us to move some of the money out of the operating budget and into the bond. Um, this brought us to a position um, where our budget numbers were very close. And I also want to thank, on behalf of the Finance Committee, the entire school department for all of your hard work on the budget, as well as all of your efforts and that of teachers and staff throughout the year. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the town manager, the municipal department heads, and our town clerk for all of their work individually and collectively on the budget. Countless hours have been devoted to this by the town and school employees, and we appreciate everyone's hard work. Reasonable people can differ on whether the budget should be $43,000 more or less than the $29.2 million that the Finance Committee has proposed for this public hearing. But no one can differ in the conclusion that everyone involved worked diligently and in good faith to put forth a budget that best serves the people of Cape Elizabeth. Finally, I just want to comment on where we are in the process. We used to hold a public hearing and vote on the budget in the same night. Last year, at the request of the school board, we added an additional step, an additional night, if you will. So tonight is the public hearing. We are here to listen to your comments on the budget. We will not be commenting, or likely not be commenting, and we definitely won't be voting on the budget for the school or the municipality until next week. 
although tonight we will on our agenda um, our plan is to vote on what we call the special funds budget for things like Fort Williams and rescue so in advance I'd like to thank you again on behalf of the Finance Committee for participating and I encourage you to come next week or to tune in for the final vote on the budget and thank you and I want to thank all of members of the Finance Committee who worked also diligently hard to put together this budget and they were a pleasure to work with Thank you very much, Marianne. Okay, we will move to the public hearing. I hereby open the public hearing on the proposed budget. Do we have anybody who would like to speak first on the um, proposed fiscal year 2008 municipal, county, school, and community services budget? Hello, I'm Nancy Marshall. I live at 10 Wildwood Drive, and I am a senior citizen. Um, although I do have grandchildren in the public school system, and therefore I am very concerned um, that we maintain the quality of the Cape Elizabeth schools. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to you tonight. I support Superintendent Hawkins and the school board's recommendations, and I know the struggle that you've gone through. It doesn't seem to be quite the struggle that we had last year, but still, it's always an exercise. I think that as a senior citizen on what some people term a fixed income, I nevertheless continue to believe that a quality education is a birthright for the children of every generation. They are the future of this country. And I would just like to say a word about fixed income. Some people believe that Social Security is a fixed income. It's not a fixed income. It is adjusted upward. I've never seen it adjusted downward, hopefully. Um, but it is adjusted upward each year according to the cost of living. So the fact that people believe that it's fixed, yes, it's fixed because I get a check every month, but that check is supported by the people who are paying their taxes, many of whom are young parents whose children are in school. When my own four children were in school, I relied on other people to pay their share, senior citizens as well as young parents. And because the fabric of our society is held together by these social contracts that we make as individuals and that we expect of others, working families help to fund Social Security for me as a senior, and seniors help to support the goals of working families in educating their children. And again, just as seniors pay taxes to support the public school education of my four children, I am prepared and actually very much support funding the education of today's students. I think it's really important for everyone to realize in a community as supportive at all levels, I believe, as Cape Elizabeth is, that we get every one of us benefit from excellent schools. And so a well-educated citizenry brings many positives to us as a community, as a state, as a nation, and as a world. And I really appreciate the work that you've done, and I hope that you will be able to support at least the 3% for our schools for this year. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Anybody else? <clears throat> Is there anyone else who would like to speak? My name is Trish Brigham, um, and I wasn't going to speak tonight because you probably know what my opinions are, but I couldn't let the evening go by. Um, the efi efficiency seems to be one of the buzzwords this year because of consolidation and everything else. Um, and the efficiency be benchmark that we've you've chosen to use is the CPI. This is year three of the pledge that several of you took. 
However, the CPI is still being used as a benchmark. I guess if we're going to, or if you're going to continue with arbitrary cost control percentages that to some extent ignore the information that we provided as a school board, um, I would beg of you to please consider a figure that better accurate, or that more accurately reflects the budgetary characteristics, primarily labor, of the school department's budget. Second, maintenance. Maintenance has been the operative word for several years. Maintenance, it, maintenance ignores a couple things. Changing needs of our students. Increased demands that have been placed on the school district in the past five or six years. We have had increasing enrollment. This is really the first year we've had decreasing enrollments. But regardless of enrollment, no child left behind has happened during those past five or six years. No child left behind means what it says. The bell curve, you know, when we were all going through college, school, there were kids at the lower end. We can't leave them there anymore. We have to do things differently. Increased standardized testing, changing special education laws, general societal demands on the schools have changed. Schools have had to step in to fill the gaps where families cannot because of other societal um, issues. When families, uh, the schools have been providing health and psychological services more so than they've done in the past. Enrollment versus staffing. While it's a pure number analysis may be considered in justifying funding decisions, it's not just a numbers game. If enrollment decreases by 25 students, it really matters where that decrease is happening in order to, for the corollary to be, well, there's 25 kids less, we must need one less staff person. The school board carefully scrutinizes, one, any position that is added, and or two, bases its guidelines on class sizes and teacher loads, which have been carefully scrutinized and are clearly in line with national and state averages. This year, we did add a half-time kindergarten teacher because of the kindergarten class size. Had those numbers, or we've been looking at those numbers at, a, at upper grade, we might not have added that teacher. So it really depends where the decrease in enrollment is happening. Also, again, to sort of tie back that the enrollment, enrollment may be declining, but to tie back into the, to the needs of the students, we're going to have to add an English, as, English language learner teacher. Two years ago, or even a year ago, we didn't have to do that. So it's not just numbers, it's needs. And I would just like you to keep that in mind. I appreciate all the work you've done. I appreciate the sense of compromise. Um, and I would just like you to think a little bit more about what it is we do and not just sort of productivity and efficiency. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Do we have any other um, citizens that would like to speak on this part of the budget? Uh, my name is Jeff Hindle. I live at uh, Jewett Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, me, I have two children who are in the Cape Elizabeth Public Schools. Um, and we moved here in 2004, a few months after uh, several members of the town council uh, adopted a spending cap pledge. Um, Part of the reason that we moved here was from California was that California is a place that is basically spending capped its public sp schools into a ruin. And um, we were hopeful that we were moving someplace that uh, put a high priority on public education. And I would urge the town council to at least unanimously adopt the 3% compromise. Um, I'd also urge the town council, uh, my understanding is that this is the third and final year of the spending cap pledge and I would urge the councillors not to renew that pledge. Um, I think it's both unnecessary and unfair. Um, I was a prosecutor for 16 years. In a trial, jurors are required to pledge that they will not decide the case until they've heard all of the evidence in the case and all of the arguments from both of the parties. 
and it seems to me that the spending cap pledge is exactly the opposite of that procedure that it is a pledge to decide the issue in advance before you've heard all the evidence and before both parties have had their opportunity to be heard. I also think the spending cap pledge is unnecessary. If you want to be fis fiscally responsible, if you think that keeping property taxes low is a more important value than, than increasing the school budget, you're perfectly free to vote that way at the time when the time comes. There's no reason for counselors to be shackling themselves to a particular position in advance of the facts and in advance of giving the public an opportunity to be heard on the issue. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to speak on these particular issues? Good evening, Cynthia Garfield, Abaco Drive. Thank you, Councillor Lynch and the rest of the uh, Finance Committee for your creative work this year in uh, funding through the bond issue, and uh, it sounds like a good bond for the town, and I appreciate that. I, too, support uh, Mr. Hindle and Ms. Ms. Brigham's uh, position that I'm really glad that it's the last year of the spending cap, and um, it creates inflexibility so that the public feels that public input is really doesn't, there's not enough flexibility in the process for people really to, to make a difference. And I agree with Mr. Hindle that we really have to evaluate each year. And each year over the past three years, we have minimally funded increases. We're not looking for advances in quality or outcomes. And recent test scores have shown that Yarmouth and a few other towns are, are gaining ground on us where um, decades past, Cape was far above the other schools in Maine. So I think, you know, a minimalist approach has been followed for a few years and we need to have flexibility for future years. So I look forward to um, being released from the shackles of the spending cap. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else on, on these topics? I'm Jana Zimmerman. I'm at 81 Oakhurst Road. I have a fourth grader going into middle school. You notice I didn't bring a stack of books this year. Um, came without my props. And I think mainly because that is because we're in the midst of determining what textbooks would be adequate for our needs. And we still have outdated textbooks. That's now a proven fact. We also have a lot of other needs because for years and years we've deferred spending. And the cumulative effect of that deferred spending from a non-finance person's perspective has become detrimental to our schools. And the spending caps, deciding something, I just wanted to say IBID to that gentleman, that um, everything he said was something that I have struggled with and been frustrated with for a long time now, that we have put the cart before the horse. The facts in the case are very carefully considered by our school board. We elected our school board to very carefully and to consider all the different varied aspects of a school district. And I think they've done a tremendous job. I've watched them just in the workshops and I'm impressed by the amount of detail that they go into and the knowledge of our school system. Therefore, I thought you should know, Ms. Lynch reported about a difference that sounds like a very small difference, but it's actually not um, a small difference. The actual budget was 4.28% that the superintendent recommended. That's $19,000, I mean $19 million um, and um, some odd cents. That's a much different budget then was carefully scrutinized by the school board and they came to a conclusion that they couldn't recommend that. But you should know that that budget didn't even include some of the things that Mr. Weatherby had recommended. And one of those things I think might be in violation of a certain title. So there are things that were even excluded beforehand that are necessary. School board reviewed it they excluded some other things, and they came down to what seemed to be a reasonable position to them. But now we're down to a 3% increase. 
That's very different, even though I do appreciate the compromise and I do appreciate things that are going to be bonded. But I did think you'd want to know that. When you compare Cape schools with other schools in just Maine, we're known as an affluent community. Well, there's some other affluent communities that are scoring higher on MEAs. So um, realtors could be prepared to think about helping us relocate to Yarmouth. Second place would be Falmouth, MEAs fifth through eighth grade. In every single category, only one time did Cape score. And that's in the meets and does not meets category. They also do better in, than us in reducing the children that partially meet and do not meet standards. So whichever way you go, we're below those. Um, we have pretty good SAT scores in the high schools. But I don't know that that will last. And if you compare them to a true school of excellence, Highland Park Independent School District, which has the only school district in the nation, three blue ribbon schools, their SATs are, their composite is 1771. Ours is 1689. So we still have quite a ways to go to get that number of blue ribbon schools, that SAT score. So I just want to close with I hope you'll definitely support 3.0, but I'd like you to consider all the things that have been left out of that budget and the cumulative effect of that on our children's needs today, tomorrow, and when my child graduates from high school. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Do we have anybody else who would like to speak on these budgets? Good evening, Chairman McKinney, Chairman Lynch. Uh, I know many of you very well. Uh, my name is Dwight Ely, and I've had the pleasure of having uh, some outstanding students in my classes. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, know me, I've had the pleasure of working for Cape Elizabeth for the last 15 years uh, as both a teacher in the high school and an uh, assistant principal at the high school. I'm now working on my second thousand Cape Elizabeth students. So I come to you tonight with uh, great sincerity and um, a message from the teachers who are not here. Uh, frankly, they um, learned last year it didn't make a difference. I want to deliver a message from the Cape Elizabeth Association. The title of the message is, A Call by Teachers and Staff for the Renewal of a Commitment to Excellence in Cape's Schools. Teachers and staff in Cape Elizabeth schools are working under the assumption that the vision for Cape schools that appears at our website to be one of the best in the nation is in fact a vision that is supported by the Cape Elizabeth community. We know that Cape parents expect their children will be prepared to compete and succeed at the most prestigious colleges and universities in the nation. We frequently hear it said that Cape schools are one of the most important features in making Cape Elizabeth such a desirable place to live. We support this view. But as you know, over the past three years, Cape Elizabeth Town Council's decision regarding the financial support given to our schools has been driven not by a consideration of the school needs as determined by either the superintendent of our schools or by our school board, but by a cap arbitrarily pegged to a national economic indicator, the CPI. Last year, the school board established a needs-based budget and requested an increase in its budget of about 7%. The council approved an increase of 3.9%. This year, the school board developed a maintenance budget and requested an increase of about 4.2%. The Council has tentatively approved an increase, as you know, of 3%. Now, to put these figures in some kind of perspective, <clears throat> just to keep pace with inflation in salaries and benefits and provide a real increase in each school employee's monthly take-home pay of only $55 requires a budget increase of about 3.2%. And that's before considering cost of fuel, computers, books, or anything else. Teachers are sensitive 
to the need to be prudent. And I'll be glad to regale you with stories of how we buy used books off the internet. However, council members have frequently pointed out with apparent sense of pride that Cape Elizabeth, with the highest per household income in the state, already spends $1,500 less per pupil than surrounding schools. In our zeal to be fiscally conservative, we believe it is important to remember that our goal is to be a blue ribbon school, not a blue light special. As should be expected, this three-year focus on spending caps, not needs, has had harmful consequences for our schools. For example, first choice candidates to fill teaching positions can do and have declined our offers of employment and taken better paying positions at other highly competitive schools. Innovations for programs and curriculum, if advanced at all, have been possible primarily because funds have been made available to the schools through private donations. Students and parents have been forced to assume a larger burden in paying for the privilege to participate in sports. Our pay for play fee is $125 per student with no family discount. I can find one neighboring school that charges students $12. Investments in technology have been placed on a schedule that is certainly destined to put CAPE behind where it was only a few years ago. And investments in professional development have been reduced or even suspended. These simply <clears throat> are not the hallmarks of a school that will become one of the best schools in the nation, or even remain the best school in Maine. We therefore call for renewal of the commitment this town has shown in the past to provide the resources necessary to ensure that Cape schools continue their tradition of excellence. Thank you. I have not logged as many hours probably as Councillor Swift Chiata, but we have logged a lot of hours together <clears throat> listening to budget requests. And in the last two and a half months that I've been sitting in the audience, I unfortunately have never had or heard anyone say, by the way, Mr. Shedd, what would be the consequences in the high school if we only gave you a 2.5% increase as opposed to a 3% increase? And so I'd like to answer that question. Our high school principal is incredibly forthright, and he doesn't like us to have surprises. And so he has shared with us very candidly what we need to be considering, not knowing what the budget outcome would be. And what he has said was, <clears throat> if the budget outcome is 2.5%, we need to be prepared to eliminate our choral program, our Latin program, elimination of a high school requirement for our technology for graduation, possibly a math position. And the one that bothers me the most is, if we eliminate these positions and we have these students who are no longer in classes, what do we do with them? And one of the solutions is, well, you make your periods longer and you reduce your uh, periods from eight to seven. Now, for those of you who have uh, not had kids in high school, you may not understand the implications of this, but if you, and I know you've all been to college, you know how difficult it is to get those schedules to work just right. If we went to a seven period schedule, it would of course eliminate or make it much more difficult for our AP students to pick up um, all the AP classes they wanted, because AP classes are singletons, and you have a hard time getting them in your schedule if you only have seven slots as opposed to eight. On the other end of the spectrum, for those students who are really just worried about passing their classes, if you eliminate a period, that's one less period our students have to go to the Achievement Center or to get extra help from a teacher. Now, I have no doubt that you are well-intended. I don't doubt that for a minute. I know many of you reasonably well, and I respect you and have the greatest admiration for you. 
But I think it is, it is difficult, <clears throat> having been on the Scarborough School Board myself, um, it is difficult to somehow be able to reach down and say, wow, what are the daily consequences of our decisions? And these are the daily consequences, consequences, consequences of our decisions. Thank you very much for your time and your patience and your attention. Thank you, Ms. Teeley. Do we have anybody else who would like to speak on these particular budgets? Okay, now we will move on to the proposed bond issue. Oh, sir. That's okay. You beat me to it last time. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> My name is David Hillman. I live at Clarenbrook Drive in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the increase in the school budget. I understand that there has been a tentative compromise at 3%. Um, I think that, that um, everything that everybody has said in terms of caps, in terms of um, whether that's the appropriate function for a town council, representative, government, uh, et cetera, have been said. I think it is important to have an excellent education in Cape Elizabeth. I would support at least a 3% cap, I mean, excuse me, a 3% increase and in whatever uh, this council in this oversight judgment of the school board committee's recommendations believes is appropriate. Uh, so I don't want to repeat all that, but I do want to alert everybody in this town to something and that is that this has been a fascinating discussion. It's been a fascinating debate for a couple of years. It's about to become moot. And that mootness is, is in the form of a train that's leaving Augusta. And I don't want to, I'll mix a metaphor. It's leaving the station, but it's about to hit us, and it's called school, school consolidation. It's almost the, next year, it may not matter what we vote in Cape Elizabeth. It may not matter at all. It may matter what, it, what we vote as part of South Portland, Scarborough, uh, um, Gorham, um, five other places, in which case um, um, whether we want to spend more for our education or we want to spend less, it's not going to matter as much. We will have very little say in it. And I think the key thing for, this, for people in this town to understand is what is emerging from the subcommittee to the full committee in, in Augusta is, is something almost as bad as what you all got scared about when Governor Baldacci came on his proposal, and that is there will be consolidation. Today's newspaper talks about it as being almost a fait accompli in the legislature, which is an extremely scary concept, because they're talking about school consolidation at um, a minimum of 2,500 students, which means CAPE has to consolidate, which means most schools have to consolidate. And Virtually, there's no evidence that consolidation really produces any savings, get to claim that it does. There's virtually no evidence, uh, as, although claimed in the newspaper, that consolidation will increase courses and give us uh, increased salaries for teachers, but in actuality, no one's been able to prove that. And in fact, if you look in the business world, consolidations usually do not result in any reduced costs. And I think that the key thing for this town, the town councils, the school committee, and for people in this town to realize that we do love our town, we do love our school system, we do want to make it better. I'm c convinced after having communicated with the school committee members and the town council that um, the real gorilla in the room is, was, was the Tabor and is now Tabor in another form, which is school consolidation. And I think we should do the best we can this year, but we really st should start gearing up this year for this train that's about to hit us. And that, quite frankly, when 70% of our budget is being controlled by a region, we're no longer Cape Elizabeth, we're RDU 32, and we have very little say in that. We may want to spend more for our schools, we may want to spend more for our, our children, and I'm willing to do it, but I'm not going to be able to do that um, if this thing goes through. So we did, uh, if I may make a constructive suggestion, um, there is a, I've talked with a lot of people in, um, who have some connections in Augusta, people on other school committees, people are talking to people on the various committees in Augusta. And having read the uh, newspaper today, it was interesting to comment about how it seems to be almost a done deal that some form of consolidation will occur. Uh, now is the time to, make, to do what we can to change that in some way to preserve the, 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 the school system that we have here in Cape, whether that's a form of um, 
an exception for uh, efficient administration of schools, which we do have here. Whether that'll fly or not, I don't know. Quite frankly, I don't think it'll fly, although it should, because I don't think they really want efficient schools. I think this is a disguised attempt to reduce the budget, the budget deficit that they are projecting on, on the backs of school children. I think that's the reality. So however efficient we are, that may not be an exception that's going to be uh, allowed. Um, there are other alternatives that people are proposing. I think we ought to create a task force like we did on the Tabor um, a referendum of volunteers. I'd be willing to serve on it. I'm sure given the amount of lawyers in this town, there'd be a lot of people willing to serve on it. Uh, where we can see what we can do as citizens uh, to, to try and change what's going on in Augusta. Regrettably, I, I know the town council, I know the school board has tried what they can. Regrettably, for, uh, Augusta, and I, I, I speak about Augusta in general, not, not in reference for a particular representative here, but uh, you looked on as partisan. You looked on somehow as having a, a dog in a fight. Now, why when you're, we're paying you such, it's not as if you're making great money off what you're doing now, or our school board's making a huge sum of money. You have, you're somehow a partisan that sort of boggles my mind a bit, but it is a fact of life. I've been told that by lobbyists and other people more experienced in Augusta than I am. I think what we need to do is for the town council or, or for the citizens of this town to realize that that's the real issue. What we do in the next couple of weeks is very important, but it'll soon become moot if we don't do something about what happens in Augusta. And I, I'm talking to a variety of people, I think the best way we can do that is to form some sort of a citizens committee, um, sort of like we did with the table task force, and, and organize and try to influence what happens in Augusta. I think they will listen, uh, like the Portland Press Herald talks today about how people think in Augusta that this is not a problem for people in the state of Maine. I think it's not a problem for people in the state of Maine because they don't realize the game has changed. It is not what the Baldacci administration talks about. It's simply the, the it's inefficiencies in school administration. We are talking about mandatory substantive school consolidation not administrative, school consolidation, replacement of school boards with regional boards. That's substantive, not administrative consolidation. And that is, a, that is far more scary than 3.0, 3.2, or 3.4, because we won't have a say in that anymore. So I would urge this council to consider um, setting up um, information hearings, um, um, talking with other towns, setting up a task force, to study this and educate our citizenry and advocate, um, regrettably we should do it through citizens as opposed to our elected officials in Augusta to try to address the issue, the gorilla, that's really that's gonna be the problem for us um, in the next, well, according to the paper, by 2008. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hillman. Anybody else who would like to speak about this particular budget. Okay, let's go to the proposed bond issue. Is there, any, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak about the bond issue? Okay, we'll move on to the proposed fiscal year 2008 special funds budgets. Anybody want to make any comments? Okay, how about the adjustment in the building permit fee? All right. We will move on then. Item number 78, draft bond resolution. Um, I would move that we adopt the draft bond resolution as more fully set forth in our agenda. Uh, there are a number of items on pages one, two, three and part of page four that um, would be part of my motion and I guess are necessary to satisfy bond council when we go to sell these bonds. And I guess I would just summarize that um, this would be to authorize a bond issue um, with expenditures of up to $2.4 million for various capital projects and the costs associated and the issuance of bonds to finance such expenditure. We have a second. Second the motion. Jim, any discussion? 
Okay, all in favor? Thank you. Okay, now we'll move on to item number 79. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. I would like to move um, that we vote to take items 79 through 85 together. Is that on bonk? I'm you want to go? the Latin, but. Okay. Second. Very good. Any discussion? And more specifically, that would be to adopt the budget for the sewer fund, the Riverside Cemetery Fund, the Spurwing Church Fund, the Fort Williams Park Capital Fund, the Thomas Jordan Fund, the Rescue Fund, and the Portland Headlight Fund, as um, set out in the agenda. Okay, very good, thanks. Councilor Lynch, and then Councilor Beck, a second. All in favor? Very good. Okay, item number 86. Well, that was just, that was just uh, approval of the motion right. to take them as You're a absolutely correct. Okay. okay. Now, now we'll move on. And now on. I would move that we take up those budgets, item 79 um, through 85, that we um, approve those budgets as set out more specifically in our agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah. And any, any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Thank you. And okay, now we'll go to item number 86. We have a motion. Okay, um, I will move that the town council adopt the recommended increase in the building permit fee from seven tenths of 1% of the value of the improvement to 1% with the increased revenue, that is three tenths of 1% to be placed in an infrastructure improvement fund also known as an impact fee. Do we have I'd a like to set aside the effective date for okay. a moment. Do you want to, do you want to go ahead and uh, include that in your motion? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, maybe I should include that. And I guess um, the town manager has proposed that it be effective July 2nd, which I assume is the beginning because of the beginning of the fiscal year. I would like to suggest that these fees be effective um, tomorrow as we vote on it tonight. Um, I don't see any reason to cause a rush into the planning office to avoid the fee. Um, and it's been noticed and it's been talked about. It's been in the local papers. It comes as no surprise to anyone. Let's have a, do we have a second on this motion? So. I'll second it for the purposes of discussion, that's, Paul, that's but I, uh, would like to ask the manager if he has any comments. That was my next move. Exactly. One way or another on Mike, the date. would you like to comment on that particular issue? The yeah. date? It, it's really up to the council the date. Uh, you know, I don't know of you know any major issues that are about to happen. Uh, you know, in the next few months, I, I, I do think if it's the desire of the council to move it up, I would suggest you you give us about a week in order to to update the website, have the notices, and the people. I'd, I'd hate to see them show up tomorrow with the checks already prepared from their offices and uh, not have the right amount. But if you want to move it up, that's up to the council. Uh, and uh, then I would um, amend my motion with or withdraw my motion and change it to an effective date of um, May 14th. Okay. Do we have a second? And do you agree with that? Uh, yes. I'll, okay. I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion on the issue at this point? Okay, all in favor? Okay. All right. Do you want to um, clarify this publicly, Michael? Do you want, would you like me to do that? Is that important? Up to you. Well, I, I just think, um, first of all, just uh, what we just passed was the this affects minimum fees. Well, the minimum fee up to $2,500 value will be $25. Projects above $2,500 value will be a 1% fee of the total estimated value of the building. And late fees will be double the full fee. Okay. Now we'll move on to item number 87. 
Do we have a motion? Ann. Um, I move that we refer to the ordinance committee the proposed updates to the town's construction code and fire protection code as set out in the April 2nd memo from Bruce Smith to Michael Governor. Is there a second? Jim? Second the motion. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. I just did a question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I assume that the code enforcement officer is the staff person assigned to the ordinance committee for this consideration? For the purposes of this, he, 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 while, while you, you give me a chance to say something for a minute, he also just uh, made a recommendation to me the day the packets came out of wanting to look at Article 2 and 3 of the sewer ordinance. So, you know, you just a fair notice that that's coming up as well. Thank you. Probably on next month's agenda for referral. Okay, item number 88. We have a motion. Ann. Um, I move that we amend the Spurwink Church use policy with the following additional language, quote, Spurwink Church will be closed during calendar year 2009 for repairs, unquote. And I presume this is due to the um, upcoming work project. Yeah, we, you want to, and you want a second first? I want a second first. Second. Yeah. David? Yeah, we, we had originally looked at doing it in 2008. We, that was when we were thinking that a lot of the committee members who were on the prior committee would want to continue. That didn't totally pan out, so the Appointments Committee has some work to do. And we're getting calls for folks wanting weddings and other events, particularly weddings in 2008. And it, it just doesn't make any sense to close it in 2008 if we're not absolutely sure that the plan's going to be ready. And with my experience with building projects over the last few weeks, I'd rather take time, uh, make sure everyone uh, has a chance to comment on whatever is going to happen at the Spring Meeting House. That, that uh, hints to me that 2009 would be better than 2008. Okay. Thanks for the uh, clarification, Mike. So uh, all in favor? And now we move on to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anybody who would like to make a comment on any items that we haven't brought up or are not on the agenda? Okay. Now we move to adjournment. Do we have a motion? So moved. Cynthia, second. Sarah. And I'll, I'll just say before we vote that the town council is scheduled scheduled a special meeting for Monday, May 14, 2007, for budget adoption. This both the municipal and the school budget. And Mr. Chairman, could I just ask for clarification? Um, the manager mentioned that there were two uh, upcoming workshops on the comprehensive plan. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to know, I've seen two different times for those. Are those are at 7 or at 7.30? The, the meeting notice that went out went out for 7.30. Okay. Okay. Thank the, you. There's a lot of things to cover. The, the plan is on the 21st of this night is to try to focus more on the land use issues uh, and then on the, the 29th to, to deal with the rest of the issues. I, I ask uh, not only because I wanted to know what time the meetings were, but the appointments committee will be meeting on the 29th before the comp plan meeting. And I just wanted to know if we had to adjust our start time. Thank you. Any other topics or anything else? Clarification. Okay, all in favor of adjournment. Thank you very much.